we have examined the connections between language and ideology in education. We have looked at student language identities and the culturally and linguistically responsive approaches to uh, teaching writing. We have highlighted the importance of creating equitable uh, opportunities for oral participation in the classroom and also recommended strategies for productive transcultural communications that can best serve the needs of minority underrepresented underprivileged uh, groups and also looked at ways to create uh, campus-wide language diversity initiatives. So we've done quite a bit. Today's workshop is going to broaden, still broaden our horizon by taking us beyond the scope and space of a college campus. So leading the workshop today are my colleague, uh, Dr. Yi Wang, who's a lecturer in the Department of Asian and Asian American Studies and an MIC affiliated faculty at Stony Brook University. And Dr. Wen Hao Diao, an associate professor in the Department of East Asian Studies and the second language acquisition and teaching doctoral program at the University of Arizona. Dr. Wang's research focuses on the social and cultural aspects of language use and learning by transnational and multilingual students. Dr. Diao's work concerns the identities, ideologies, the equalities and inequalities that are produced or reproduced and distributed and redistributed through language learning and teaching in various contexts with a particular focus on study abroad and Mandarin Chinese learning. So I now give the floor to uh, Professor Wong and Professor Diao. Okay, uh, thank you, Agnes, uh, for the introduction. Sorry. And um, I'm really happy to see all of you here. And it's my honor to invite uh, Dr. Diao to uh, uh, co-host this event. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's start. Uh, okay, so today we're going to talk about language learning in study abroad context. And before that, I want to give you an overview of what we are going to do for this workshop. So here's the workshop outline. Uh, we will first discuss some show social imaginary, what kind of discursive discourses around the concept of study abroad context. So the so-called study abroad myths. And the focus of this workshop is on identity. So we will spend some time looking at the intersectionality of identities in study abroad context by introducing three key conceptual framework and also the student real examples from published work in this field. We hope that through the discussion of the frameworks and some successful and some maybe not that successful examples of identity negotiation in such context could give us a sense of the identity research in study abroad context and also provide some tools for us to look at identity in such transnational contexts. So we will then provide uh, some cases from our own data for you to discuss in small groups and come back together to share your observation and experiences. And we will conclude with implications for both educators and students. We have uh, teachers and students here. So um, let's get started then. Uh, when we talk about study abroad, I want you to give like have five or 10 seconds to think about what kind of words actually occur to you when you think about study abroad, study abroad programs? So just think in your mind about uh, the commonly talked discursive discourses around study abroad in North America. What kind of things we actually talked about when we talk about study abroad programs? Uh, we actually put out uh, one image from a very large app, uh, website for study abroad programs. Uh, here is the image for promotion for the study abroad programs. You can see the very exotic and beautiful scenery uh, from a, a, country, a, a country or city different uh, outside of the US. And also the uh, promotion words here ready for a change of scenery. 
So as if like study abroad is just to go out to have a tour to change for place for scenery. And also a very frequent used word for life changing in study abroad. Um, I'm not really sure if you have looked at any promotion brushes of study abroad programs, but life changing is a word that used very frequently to promote study abroad uh, programs. But that raised the question of life changing for what? Is that a tourist um, program or something? So some of the discursive discourses around the study abroad, uh, at least there's several. For example, uh, early study abroad programs always sometimes treat the study abroad as a grand tour. So students and uh, program designers actually treat it as kind of a way to look at the different scenery to have a tourist experience. So do not really engage in the local communities and you know, uh, use the languages that much. And also when we talk about study abroad, sometimes we have the myth about study abroad will provide you as a total immersive in, in experience. As if like if you, we put you in, for example, in China, you will have totally immersed into the language, linguistic and the cultural environment. And you will have plenty of opportunities to speak Chinese, to engage with Chinese culture, et cetera. And links to that, we have the kind of myth about study abroad naturally and you know, uh, naturally will provide you opportunities to talk to locals. So if you go to another foreign country, you will have plenty of opportunities to talk to locals, to engage with conversations with locals, to improve your intercultural communication uh, competence. And also for a lot of language learning programs, uh, for students, they have the mindset, there might be just a language learning experience to totally immerse in this environment, to use as much language as you can to improve your language proficiency. And also the language, the, 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 the words that frequently talked about study abroad, the life changing. So life changing for what? For what aspect? To improve your language proficiency, to improve your intercultural communication competence. So life changing for what? So that raises a lot of questions about the study abroad myth. We will come back to this myth after we talk about several stories from the students. So uh, there's a transition in terms of the study abroad uh, research area. And I turn the floor to uh, Wen Hao to talk about the research in study abroad. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Um, oh, sorry. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my morning. Um, so yes, study abroad research, um, especially with regard to language learning during study abroad, can be traced back to about uh, 1960s in North America. But it really started um, with uh, the book that was published in 1995 that you see here that's, uh, that has the yellow cover, the second language acquisition in the study abroad context. And so back then, um, that book already had a variety of approaches, but the main concern was um, the main questions were, you know, do students learn better in study abroad? So we see a lot of research comparing study students who study abroad and students who did not. And in terms of their language use, in terms of their grammatical development, vocabulary, uh, fluency, et cetera. So there were lots of uh, um, positive evidence, but also some things that are a bit um, confounding. But I think the, the, the main concern that people realized was, wait a minute, students who go abroad are not randomly selected. They are self-selected. Self they chose to go abroad. And also in terms of the actual experience abroad, it's not whether or not you go abroad, that would help with your language learning, but rather the quality of your experience abroad. What do you actually do? What kind of access do you have? Um, what kind of opportunities do you participate in? And therefore we see, and also in the early research, we also already noticed some very 
important evidence such as, you know, we see uh, research about women's experience, um, you know, um, women's experience um, was not the same as men. We noticed, especially in the um, big project that came out of from Russia, um, students felt some female students uh, reported instances of har harassment, for example. Um, and so people started to think about, okay, maybe we need to think about all of these things. Is it gender? Is it quality of experience? Is it the actual interactions? And then we see a variety of more research. Um, and as we focus more on these experiences, we are also seeing more um, focus on identity, on multilingualism, on translanguaging, terms that you probably have already heard of uh, throughout the semester. Um, so one of the things that uh, is becoming in increasingly important in the study abroad research is the concept of identity. Um, because once we move from one place, one cultural context to another cultural context, such as study abroad, we are talking about different kinds of communities, different kinds of memberships, different kinds of linguistic practices, et cetera. And so, and then what do we bring with us when we cross borders and go to another country, another cultural context and linguistically different contexts as well. And so we are seeing um, more and more focus on these social cultural aspects. And we are noticing not just um, the identity and the experience, but also how identity becomes evoked, um, becomes negotiated, redistributed, and reinterpreted in different contexts and brings up, brings about more questions about, you know, equities and inequities, right? And so for the rest of our focus today, we're going to be on, uh, we're going to be uh, examining identity and study abroad in relation to language learning. But what is identity? I'll yeah. give the floor back to E. So what is identity, right? And how does it actually relate it to the study abroad context and the language learning? Um, I pulled out a, a table that uh, uh, in King Ginger 2013 book, um, talking about there's actually the researchers started to look at identity in study abroad context. Um, and the, a lot of the research um, focused on just the one dimension of the identity, looking identity as different categories such as racial identity, gender identity, ethnic uh, identity, social class, nationality, etc. So, have uh, several researchers already started to look at identities uh, in that way. So we want to uh, talk about some approaches to identity in the most recent uh, research to give you some of the context and the tour of how to approach the question of identity here. So by showing some of the, exam uh, the successful examples of identity negotiations or some identity struggles uh, and its relationship to the language learning and use in the study abroad context. We will first talk about community of practice. So we talked about the myth of the total immersion and talking to locals. What kind of opportunities and access actually available for the learners to use the target language? Uh, and how to gain the access and the opportunities to use uh, to the local communities? Uh, and versus also the imagined monolingualism as if the everyone, uh, the, the uh, every speakers in the country that, for example, the Chinese uh, people speak Chinese in China. So the kind of imagined monolingualism and how it influenced the access and opportunities of our learners to use the target language. We will also talk about identity and the investment. So how the participation in language use and also how it, the identity transformation and the future possibilities in becoming for the learners. And we will also talk about actual language use in a study abroad context by introducing the concept of language socialization. How the actually, uh, how the, the actual language use happening in the language, uh, in the so study abroad context. So I start by the uh, conceptual framework about the community of practices, which was first uh, introduced by Leif and Wenger in 1991. There are three key elements to 
gain access to a local community or gain the membership to the community. The mutual engagement among members, a joint enterprise and a shared repertoire. So for language learners in study abroad context, the learning actually occurs through the process of the legitimate peripheral participation where the newcomers who are granted the legitimacy begin moving along a trajectory from the peripheral to a more partic a full participation of the community. And also we talked about imagine the community that the, this was first uh, developed by Benedict Anderson in his 1983 book, talking about nationalism. However, Norton expanded this notion to the language learning and the commonly uh, uh, existing the imaginary of a future community for the language learners and also the speakers of the nations um, the equals one, the speakers to the nations, for example, the people in China, the locals in China would speak Chinese, the standard Chinese here. So um, I would provide you two examples for how the students, the, the, the stories of the students, how they actually gain their access and um, opportunities to engage with the communities using the target language here. So the first study I want to talk about was uh, written by uh, Emma Trentman, talking about variations in study abroad students' language use and engagement. Uh, she talks about Arabic learners from the US uh, study abroad in Egypt. So there is a imagined monolingual Arabic speaking community. Imagine that in Arabic countries, the everyone, uh, the locals all speak um, Arabic. And also there are a lot of challenges for women as well. So from this study, I uh, used one of the examples from the students uh, who actually did not really uh, initially did not really participate in the language learning, but participated in a newly funded women rock rugby team as a team rugby team players. So the story actually showed the, how the, uh, the students gain the status from the peripheral participation to somewhat not really central participation, not really full participation, but to somewhat shared enterprise with the community. And here are some of the, of the excerpts from the interview. So from uh, the student's point of view, uh, she said, if I'm really close with them, I generally speak English. But if I don't know them well, I speak Arabic. And also, uh, she said, I really like hanging out with Egyptians and hearing their opinions on stuff, even if it's just like speaking in English with them about things. So um, he, the learners here actually facilitate as a cultural mediators here. Although the language used here when they actually enter into the membership, uh, the, uh, when they at the peripheral uh, position, they actually use Arabic, the target language. But when they actually gaining the central, the full participation to the community, they switched from the Arabic to English. It seems that it, this participation for the community did not really bring a lot of opportunities for them to use the target and practice the target language. However, they actually gain a lot of uh, the, the, the culture, uh, 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 intercultural communication opportunities for them with the members, members here. So another uh, example from Lucian Brown's uh, study looking at exchange students uh, in Korea. So as we usually know that exchange students usually in a powerless position to engage and interacting with the main body of the students because they come here just for a short period of time and they do not, they do not really have a, 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 a group, a, 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 a subscribe, a, a, a subscribe the group for them to participate. So the Lucian Brown actually used the narrative data collected from a proficient and highly motivated white American female learners of Korea named Grace. And here's some of the experience from Grace. So as we can see here from the first excerpt, Grace was having a conversation with several international students from different country in a subway. And they were talking uh, loud using English 
and uh, they were commented by a, a, a Korean local man said this was public and they did not really understand what the man saying. And the man turned to Elise and asked if she spoke any Korean in Korean. Elise just did not really answer him and started, started start at him. And then the Korean man started to curse at her. So this was not a very pleasant conversation happening between the students and the local. However, soon it, they find out the another community for them to use the target language does not necessarily engage with the local communities here. So Grace quickly realized that the interaction with the international students was a valid and a productive context for her to use Korean, particularly since they were all motivated to use Korean with her in a way that was not necessarily shared with the native speakers here. So as we can see that they started to use Korean within the international student communities, they introduced uh, themselves in Korean to each other. So Grace here began to recognize that her ability to speak in Korean allowed her access to the communities of this non-English speaking international students, particularly the large population of Japanese students here in Korea. So in order to position herself in a way, Grace actually made use of the linguistic resources available to her and choosing to introduce herself to Koreans as international students. So this in term of international students typically used to refer to uh, students enrolled in a full degree program rather than exchange students. So her idea about practice the target language and use the target language shifted from speaking Korean to Korean people to speaking Korean with international students. So here's another example of getting the membership to the communities. However, this community is not the native language users community, but the international students community here. So uh, we talked about the opportunities and access uh, of the students uh, and break the myth of, it's not really the naturally have the opportunities for students to talk to the locals and totally immersive in the, uh, in the context of using the target language. We now tend to talk about what is identity and investment. So by, we use the, the Norton's uh, conceptualization for identity. She defines identity as how a person understands his or her relationship to the world and how that relationship is structured across time and space and how the person actually understands the possibilities for the future here. So let's look at one example to break down this very abstract uh, definition of identity here. Uh, I used the Ujana's uh, book, uh, Racialized Identity in Second Language Learning. She talks about study abroad as the transformative socialization experiences here. So in her book, she used the critical perspective and look at the experience of African-American study abroad students in Brazil. And she talks about how students are transformed into new ways of understanding doing and speaking blackness um, and how the diasporic affinity fueled by the historical, social, cultural similarities between the African-Americans and Afro-Brazilians uh, Afro incentivized and contributed to the study abroad participants' investment in learning Portuguese here. So she documents how they dealt with uh, the difficulties and the challenges in learning a new language and comparing their linguistic actions in different communities within and outside of the classroom and discusses how their emergence and transformation of new identities and the nature of participation contribute to their investment and outcome. So she concludes that study abroad and language learning as a journey not only socializes students into the target language communities, but more importantly, also transforms students' identities by changing how we think, what we can do, and our future possibilities in becoming here. So I show you one example from Nina, one of the students participants in her book. Here, uh, 
uh, in the commonly taught language classrooms, there are the ethno-racial topics that seldom over, overly address race uh, as a topic. And also many classes uh, in the US still present a very racist discourse in the curriculum through the stereotypical imaginary, like limiting blacks to kind of uh, folk rig, uh, music or tradition, put blacks in the tradition sections. And also the scant representations of black population as principal cultural agents in the language of study. However, during the study abroad programs, uh, there was a course when the in in instructor made a representation on the black family life during the slavery time and showed this picture of painting, depicting a wedding ceremony between Africans enslaved by wealthy masters. So in colonial Brazil, some members of the money elite actually showed off their riches by giving uh, the clothing, the very expensive clothing and the jewelry to enslaved servants' captors. So seeing this painting of the lavishly dressed enslaved Africans, Nina, uh, one of the study abroad students, was initially leaning back in her chair and actually moved her upper body forward and put the arms here sinking and uh, really notice this kind of picture and signals to speak here. So here is just the one uh, excerpt of the transcription. She said, I have to speak English. I've never seen this in my life. The pictures uh, of black people of this time dressed like this. So uh, she actually discontinues this kind of program mandated exclusive use of Portuguese and using the translanguaging practices to express her idea fully using English. And for the described as she never seen anything like this, but degraded and or animal-like figures of blacks. And this kind of instructional materials in the classroom positively engaged and affirmed the certain ethno-racialized aspects of her identities, compelling her to want to know more and draw closer to the Brazilians to learn about their culture and language and the Portuguese, which she was so intimately identified uh, here. So these kind of uh, examples show us how the study abroad participants racialized identity intersected with their American ethnic, cultural and social class identities and how the intersectional identity positions and relations were negotiated and engaged here. We have another example talking about the study abroad and the social class here uh, from Dr. Diao's uh, work. So um, I'm gonna talk about my own work. Um, so this uh, study is actually um, examining um, the class identity and class uh, is um, somewhat not talked about enough in the applied linguistics literature. However, when we think about study abroad, we think about the cost, we think about who can go and really what they do there, where they live, all of these things are not just you know, naturally occurring, but really they are associated with social economic class. And it's a, it's a symbol, it's a practice, um, a type of cultural practices that are associated with social economic class. So what I'm gonna focus on, um, before we move to the next slide, I'm gonna ask you a few questions. Um, all of the students, you can type in the chat. How many of you, can you just type in yes or no? Have you done an internship? Most of you said no, but some of you, yes. And for those of you who said yes, who have done internships, did you get paid for your internship? Some yes, some no, right? Um, when we think about the internships and also whether or not we get paid, we think about the need, whether or not we need to get paid immediately as college students. I know that college students are generally poor, but at the same time, you know, we come from different family backgrounds and some of us are able to afford um, the time not getting paid to work for internships as a form of professional preparation, right? Whereas some others, um, we have to get paid because, you know, we don't have the resources. And so I want you to think of such things as a, an aspect of our identity that's associated with class and our, you know, practices that we engage in um, 
in relation to our identity. And so the student that I'm going to focus on here is um, student named Zotan. Um, he came from an affluent transnational family, which I would consider as a type of global elite. Um, so he has um, he had already lived in several countries. He was originally from Hungary, um, and he lived in the United States for several years. Uh, his dad, uh, his father was uh, an economist, um, a very established economist, uh, a professor actually. And then they moved to Singapore, and he continued, um, you know, with his transna transnational life. By coming back to the United States uh, for college and attending a private elite college. And his ideal of his future was to become um, someone who could work in the international finance industry um, so that learning Chinese was actually a part of that global preparation experience. Where While he was in China, um, and he was a good student in terms of his actual uh, proficiency. But while he, when he was actually in China, he had to um, use, he was supposedly in this um, very monolingually committed program with a language pledge. He was supposed to use Chinese throughout the program. He was he, he lived with a Chinese um, roommate uh, with all these, you know, um, forms of facilitation. But in the final interview, he told me that he used a lot of English throughout his time in, in, in Beijing. And actually, um, e, could you please go back to the previous slide? I wanted to point out another aspect before we talk about the, um, the, the job aspect. So the article, in this article, I also cited a quote from um, a, a sci-fi novel, uh, novel actually, if you are interested, I highly recommend it. It's called Folding Beijing um, by uh, Hao Jingfang in Chinese, Jingfang Hao. Um, and the novel is, um, it is sci-fi. It's describing this type of dystopia, but it has its basis in our reality, which is how our lives are socially, uh, economically stratified. The main, this, uh, the main scene of this novel is about how people in Beijing lived in completely separate spaces by, based on their class, um, that they would never see each other. Um, and even though that's not actually the reality, we do know that our lives are, in fact, including cities like Beijing, our lives are indeed socially, uh, economically stratified, that people in a certain class rarely meet people from another class, let alone interacting with each other. So that is the basis that I move on to the, to the analysis. Um, could you please? And so the... Um, one of the things that Zotan experienced when he was in Beijing was the professional preparation. So every night, because of time difference, he would have to do all these interviews for his future internship in Europe, uh, in Spain, actually. And so even though he was in China, he was pre 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 preparing for internships in Europe that wouldn't actually pay him. Uh, once again, this sort of transnational elite living, preparing themselves for the transnational corporate workplace, right? You have to have all these experiences in different countries, um, and you have to prepare for those opportunities much, much sooner. So the first quote here, he was saying that, I didn't speak Chinese. I spent a lot of time talking to people in Europe in English. You may ask, well, he was interviewing for jobs in, um, in Spain. Why was at least maybe he was uh, speaking Spanish? Um, the simple answer is no. Um, the the again the sort sort of corporate uh, multilingualism, right? The idea that English would be sufficient and local languages could only just be the mere supplement. You know, you only need to know a very teeny bit of it to be able to function. The sort of flexible multilingualism. Um, and in addition to the sort of uh, dorm space, uh, you know, preparing for um, for the future uh, professional experience, his leisure activities were also very much shaped by the class identity. Um, he was participating in um, all these, you know, very sort of tourist events. But when you think about these tourist events, it's about consuming, um, you know, in places that mainly cater to um, uh, upper class transnational tourists, right? That are primarily um, not Chinese speakers. So once again, when we think about social lives in global cities like Beijing, in this case, 
the social economic class is also related to language use. When you are in that kind of um, space, then you don't really interact with people who speak the local language, who actually, you know, would have spoken very little Chinese, a very little English. And so his impression as a result was, well, I, I'm here, I'm, I've only encountered mostly English speakers without recognizing that has something to do with his class privilege and the kind of, uh, you know, uh, class stratified, you know, the, the kind of social lives that are stratified by social economic class. And moving on, the third concept that is related to uh, identity and language learning study abroad is something that uh, uh, Doctor is an expert of, uh, language socialization. Um, language socialization is um, a very important concept for us to understand the ways of becoming. Um, and so it's uh, specifically, it is referring to this dual process, the two things happening together, hand in hand, that through, first of all, language users, novice language users or children, um, use language to socialize, right? But simultaneously, they become socialized into culture, right? Into linguistically meaningful, culturally meaningful linguistic practices. So, you know, I have um, I have a four-year-old. This happens a lot in my family. I tell my child linguistically through language, what is wrong, what is right. While she's learning to speak, you know, she's still learning all these vocabularies while talking to me. She's also learning what is wrong, what is right, all these, you know, moral aspects, all these culturally conditioned um, ideas um, and practices, right? So I hope that explains. Um, but how does this, why does this matter in the study abroad context? Obviously, when we are abroad, we're also in situations where we talk with each other, we socialize with, with each other through language. And when we learn to use these you know, things, um, these linguistic expressions or certain ways of speaking, we're also learning what they mean culturally, right? So one example that I would like to present was also my, um, my research um, about uh, what I call transnational Chinese speakers, meaning that these are, these potentially could be conceptualized as some of them could be conceptualized as uh, heritage language speakers, meaning that they came from families that spoke Chinese, but some of them spoke Chinese not because they, their, their parents were ethnically Chinese, but because they had caretakers such as nannies who were Chinese. Um, but I would like to focus on someone who, um, who could be categorized as a heritage Chinese speaker, um, Melissa here. And Melissa was, um, was from um, um, a, an ethnically Chinese family um, whose parents um, migrated into the United States and run um, a, a, a Chinese restaurant. And they were from, uh, the, her parents came from a Southeastern place um, in the Fujian province. So her parents did not speak standard Mandarin. Um, for those of you who don't know a lot about standard Mandarin, um, this is the um, officially promoted variety that is Beijing based, um, whereas a lot of the a lot of places in China traditionally spoke different varieties that were not mutually comprehensible with Mandarin. But these days, many places are learning Mandarin and as we would expect if the local place spoke a different variety and then learn to speak Mandarin, there would be accents, right? One of the very famous feature of a Southern or stereotypical feature of Southern varieties in China is what we call the dental um, retrosplex merger. So I'm just trying to see, I know that there are some of you who speak Chinese here. Um, actually, could you please move back to the slide? I wanted to see if uh, the audience here, especially those of you who know Chinese, do you know what dental and retroflex merger mean? Okay, let me let me put it this way. So the dental that I that I'm referring to is the sound of z, 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 and the retroflex is what I refer to as z, z, z. Now, do we do any of you know what they mean now? Okay, we have a few. So um, so z, 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 z are different 
sounds that were perceived as, you know, mean, they mean different things. So phonemes um, in standard Mandarin, but for Southern speakers, they are frequently used interchangeably because this distinction does not exist in Southern accented Mandarin. Okay, if that makes sense. And so what happens to Melissa, who grew up in the United States, two parents who migrated from, who, uh, who you know, immigrated from Southern China was that she was exposed through home, uh, you know, through family, this uh, accent in Mandarin, right, naturally. And um, next slide, please. And so when she was a child growing up in the United States, she watched uh, Chinese shows with her parents. And from a very early stage, uh, she would hear her mom saying, oh, listen to the, you know, the TV, the, the CCTV, the Central China Television. Listen to how they speak Mandarin. They sound, don't they sound nice? Once again, when we think about language socialization, it is through such instances of, you know, linguistic use, language use, that we gain any idea about, well, this sounds nice, that doesn't. Because otherwise, you know, language is language. Why would we have these ideas about what sounds nice or not? So from a very early age, uh, she gained a very brief idea about what is standard, what is not, even though she did not speak standard. And so she knew that she did not speak standard, yet she started to attend Chinese language, formal Chinese language classes, um, especially after you know, after college, and then she went to study abroad in China. And what happened was she frequently encountered error correction. So when she used the dental retroflex merger, uh, she was told, you are wrong. This is wrong. You have to practice, practice with me. Um, but at this age, it's not. And once again, this is, you know, how she spoke at home, right? And so, so she just started to try um, to correct herself a lot to, ex to the extent that we call hypercorrection. And so in her conversation with her Chinese roommate here, you can see that um, even for words that, she, that would have been dental, um, she was doing the retroflex because she's so um, aware, highly hyper aware of, you know, the, the inaccurateness or uh, the inauthenticity of her Chinese identity that was exposed, revealed by her accent of speech, right? And so through, this is study abroad, but also this is the kind of trajectory of socialization, language socialization started prior to study abroad was confirmed and redistributed through her experience during uh, her time in China. And to the extent that she was, you know, overdoing it, right? And so these are just uh, instances in which we can see how this ethnic Chinese identity intersected with her language practices to the extent that she was um, trying very hard to be authentic Chinese, right? Um, and moving on um, to, uh, you know, thinking about, as I've mentioned, we've already started talking about intersectionality of identity. And I would like to uh, return the floor back to, um, to E to uh, further highlight this point. Yeah, uh, so <laughs> in the past 45 minutes, we feed you a lot of examples. Uh, and through the three different aspects to look at actually give a very brief overview about the study abroad research and identity right now. Uh, so we see a lot of the intersectionality of multiple identities work, very messy of uh, identity negotiations uh, happening and um, uh, in uh, the study abroad experience. What is actually still under research are how the different identities may shape and also in return, or be shaped by the study abroad experience in various contexts. That's what we are trying to uh, provide uh, some, uh, raise this question and uh, what the field is trying to uh, move uh, forward to answer this question as well. Uh, so we have, we talked a lot of student uh, uh, stories and uh, provided several concepts. What uh, we want you to do next is uh, we're going to have an activities, provide some of the case that we collected throughout um, 
uh, our uh, data collection uh, period and uh, have uh, some discussion within the small groups to share your perspectives on that. So uh, I have the Google Doc here. Okay, so I'm sending the Google Doc into the chat uh, so you can have access to the excerpts and what we're doing for this activity. Uh, so we will divide our group into nine different groups. Uh, and you can see the instruction. So first read uh, the excerpts from the assigned case. We have three different cases. So we hope that the group one, two, three, we discuss the case one and uh, six to, uh, uh, four to six discuss the case two and the rest discuss the case three. So read excerpts from the assigned case identify the identity negotiations or struggles you observed in the excerpts and describe the kind of relationship between the language le learning and use and identity. And also we have uh, teachers here and the students here. If an educator share some of your experiences in terms of the in classroom about the identity negotiation. And if your students share your experiences in learning another language. Uh, so hey, should we at least explain the cases, uh, the background briefly? Uh, yes, okay. Uh, so uh, before we break you into different breakout rooms, um, we hope to just uh, discuss a little bit about the three cases, the background of the three cases. So the first case, May, do you want to introduce? Yeah, May? so May was actually uh, um, from the same cohort as uh, Zotan. Um, and so May grew up in Hong Kong um, to, uh, from a, she came from a family that was bilingual, that her mom was from um, Hong Kong, spoke, speaking Cantonese, um, and her father was an American expatriate living in Hong Kong who spoke primarily English. And she grew up trilingually because she attended a K2, uh, K through 12 private school that is a Mandarin English bilingual school. And so she grew up trilingually using Mandarin and English in school, Cantonese and English at home. And by the time that she was um, attending the study abroad program, also in Beijing um, in the fall of 2016, um, she was already uh, uh, considered very proficient in Mandarin. So, so much so that she was placed to take courses with uh, Chinese students, uh, domestic Chinese students, uh, with, you know, just regular college level classes. And, um, and she was also uh, attending an elite liberal arts college in New England in the United States. Um, and so um, her home college was actually not too far from Stony Brook. Uh, and um, but she was studying abroad in Beijing. Okay. Okay, so uh, there are two excerpts for the group one, two, three to read um, after, after we assign the breakout rooms. So I want to talk about the background of Williams uh, for case two. Williams actually grew up in Italy and uh, he spoke Wendonese with uh, his grandparents and Mandarin and it Italian with uh, his parents here. And he self-rated as advanced uh, language proficiency for Mandarin and his parents were from Zhejiang province and later immigrated to Italy here. He attended the undergraduate study in an English medium program in Italy. And he started abroad from fall 2018 uh, for two years in an English medium programs uh, majored in international business in Shanghai. So uh, he had a required internship component in 2019. And the case actually uh, pre, uh, uh, shows like his uh, and the struggles and difficulties encountered when he's trying to find an internship and during the internship experiences. And also for case three, I selected uh, two different uh, students, James and the Heat. So James uh, with, uh, is an African-American from Chicago. He self-rated as intermediate high Chinese proficiency and studied abroad shortly before he started uh, for this uh, program in China for long term. So he studied abroad in this long-term English medium program in Shanghai started from for 2018. He lived in a dorm with a Chinese Italian in the same cohort 
And you will see some of the very interesting comments from him talking about how he used the Chinese language and how uh, his experience in China. And the hit here is a West African from uh, Niger, and he self-rated uh, as intermediate high Chinese proficiency, uh, also studied in the same program here. And he lived in the dorm by himself, uh, highly motivated in learning Chinese. And uh, we have several examples for, uh, 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 for you to look at that his experience in China. So, um, if everyone has access to the Google Doc, uh, I'll put you into the breakout room and we will have uh, 12, 15 minutes to discuss about uh, the case. I wonder um, if we could start sharing some of your, do we need to follow the order of the case? Or if you just, any of the group just want to share some of your perspectives on the case you um, have read. I think yeah, as I was going through groups, I realized that uh, the information that we gave about, at least about May was very minimal. And so it was probably not enough to show the complexities. Um, and so maybe I, let me add a little bit more here. So for May, the quote that you can see um, here is about how she would introduce herself as a study abroad student from America. So she introduced herself as American when she was in Beijing. Um, but when she was actually studying in the United States, there was also another quote in, from the interview that she said um, she couldn't identify as American. She felt that she grew up in Hong Kong. She had all these internationally minded friends, very cosmopolitan, um, whereas she was very surprised in the United States that a lot of this, her peers had never been abroad. And so that that sort of uh, uh, you know, aspect of that fluidity of identity, right? How do we think of ourselves, right? She didn't think of herself as American in America, but in Beijing, she introduced herself as an American, uh, right? And so, and also because she's uh, biracial, um, she's, you know, she's half Chinese, half white, she could present herself as both. But which one did she choose to present, right? So that fluidity of, of, uh, identity, but how that also intersected with language, right? How then when she said she was American, all the students were very surprised because her Chinese proficiency was so high that she was taking regular classes, not language classes, regular classes with Chinese students. And so there was that, you know, how people were very surprised um, that, uh, you know, so that element of surprise, sort of linguistic expectation is about how you look and what you say, who you say you are, right? You say you're American, you didn't look ch entirely Chinese, but somehow you speak natively Chinese. And so you can see how this sort of um, arguably, you know, the sort of uh, nation state language equivalent equivalence, right? That racial racialized linguistic expectation is definitely there. Um, and in terms of uh, May, um, if you go to the next slide, I do want to, uh, add a little bit more. Um, here is how she was, uh, she got to know uh, Chinese speaking friends through her Chinese roommate, um, because there were, there was at the time a lot of, you know, enthusiasm, enthusiasm for, you know, learning English in Beijing. And so she was asked to do a recording job um, through which she would have had, had opportunities to meet Chinese speakers and speak Chinese. But the program had such a strong emphasis on Chinese immersion, right? And so she felt that she shouldn't be doing more of these English teaching jobs. And so she only did it once and that was it. However, she, very similar to Zoltan, she had, um, she had an internship that was um, arranged and permitted by the program. Uh, at, in the name of, you know, having local work experience, right? And the law firm, she had the internship at the law, an international law firm, and her supervisor was from Hong Kong. But the person, her supervisor spoke only English to her, even though they should have shared several other linguistic varieties. And so, so that was also interesting to think about, you know, social economic class and how that language, which when we talk to each other, uh, when we have that shared repertoire of different linguistic varieties, which variety do we choose? 
is a meaningful act, right? Where we're indexing, we're evoking some aspects, but not others of who we are, right? And so um, this is another way of thinking about, you know, how language and identity intersect with each other when we are in the study of broad context, when we have that repertoire. Um, and to sort of also contrasting how she presented herself in different countries, right? And so, so I'm just, yeah, I just wish to add a bit more because I realized that these two quotes are taken a little out of context and it might be a bit hard for some of you to recognize um, what was going on. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I do hope to see if the audience and have any uh, responses or thoughts towards uh, these cases though. Do you, yes, uh, Agnes? I, uh, I, our group had a, a had a very, really good discussion about the, uh, the third case, and I would nominate my group members Christina and <laughs> Stephanie if, uh, to uh, share our discussion results. Okay, I guess I can. Um, hi, I'm Christina. So I'm an adoptee from China, but I came here when I was two years old. So we were talking about. Um, I know it's Stephanie. She said she came from. In, it with, in one of the states that starts with an I, but she heard Indiana. Um, Indiana. Okay, I was like, it's got to be one of them. <laughs> um, I don't know if you want to talk about your experience, or I'll just talk about. So, anyways, um, as an adoptee, like I don't have the benefit of like speaking Chinese with my family. Um, whatever I was speaking when I came here, I don't know if it was Mandarin. Or anything so like we were talking about like the expectations of like oh I look Asian and I should be able to speak an Asian language but I can't speak to a certain proficiency and um so I feel like that kind of prohibits me from like being as brave or speaking in Chinese um even when I'm learning it and then but I think because we were talking about how like with these cases how their identities or their perceived identities could affect like how they um, speak in Chinese or like whether in what context they speak in Chinese like James yeah so he was um African-American and we thought oh he might be more um aware of like the discourses surrounding racism and so like he was more aware of um the racism uh, has mentioned the racism happening when he was applying for a job versus like Stephanie, who is from West Africa, yeah, um, who um, he came from a homogenous, uh, more homogenous uh, demographic than of uh, James, so that his experience was different, and he might not. It didn't seem like he didn't say that he perceived racism as much. And yeah, like adding on to Christina said, we kind of like discussed, like you know, there's like maybe like besides that like their context of like their own like perception or own like self like issues of like identity like how they perceive themselves or how like like how it like whether they're like they're as insecure you know of like like more aware like awareness of that and like I also like mentioned how like I like am from a predominantly like white area growing up even though I did speak Chinese at home, even though I did have like go, went to Chinese school and there was like a Chinese community there. It just wasn't in the same context of like, let's say like New York City or Queens or like even like at Stony Brook. And like, and like we were talking about like coping mechanisms to like kind of amend or like with our relationship with our identity. And like one of it with me and Christina is like our like language, like we want to like um, like association with like our own people or and language and how like sometimes like we struggle with like being confident in Chinese because of like our own like lack of confidence or just like inability or like fear of like judgment which like and how even though I am, I've, I am pretty like competent in Chinese I still have a problem with like code switching like I just naturally speak English outside of my family I, I do not speak English publicly unless it's like with my family even though I am with like even though when I hang out with Chinese people I just naturally speak English even though I could speak Chinese with them because just feels weird because we're already speaking English even though like I do even though I should like be practicing Chinese more 
and when like you because I did come here with like a purpose to like you know try to practice Chinese be near like a Chinese community Asian community thank you um I recall did you uh want to say something I thought <laughs> I thought you you you, oh, you. okay yes, go ahead well, before I go. we had a good good discussion too it's a little bit echoey one of the group members said that he completely uh, understand uh, the case one, Maya's uh, feeling because of uh, some inferiority in terms of skill was uh, try, uh, making him to hide his identity. So that was a very sensitive and very important. And another student, uh, Mr. Zhu, uh, uh, he, uh, he knew a friend whose, whose father was Russian and mother was American and never wanted to learn Russian for some reason. So the motivation for language learning is based on so many different factors, some kind of prestige class or the skill level that the speaker had to bear with, and also the environment. And in case of my, uh, you know, slide seven said that uh, she had to speak English because of the job. And sometimes speakers want to speak some language you know, and doing study abroad, but they don't have the opportunity to speak the language because English, the strong language is being used in the context. So, which is a very sad situation uh, in the study abroad context. Uh, anything you want to add, Vincent? I guess I have to speak. Um, I was it was that I can completely relate to um, her feelings simply because like as a Chinese who's born in America, um, but since I was kind of raised in China for like five years, so I can speak like decent Chinese. So every time in class, people usually ask me if I'm like Chinese or, and they usually get kind of surprised when I told them that I was an ABC, but to like native um, Chinese speakers like mainlanders, um, they usually say like my Chinese is not that good because I usually like forget some words when I talk in Chinese and I still kind of when I talk in Chinese and my parents also say like, I should probably study Chinese more because it is my native language. But um, yeah, so I can completely relate to how May felt when she was studying abroad, when people say her Chinese level is not up there yet, and they were kind of wondering why she's taking Chinese class with them with that Chinese level. And that's it, thank you. Thank you. Um, because of the limit of time, um, I thank you for uh, sharing all your experiences and discussions. I went to several rooms and I heard more of the discussions and uh, I hope that benefits uh, for you uh, to look at the cases here. Um, so due to the limit of time, I moved on to um, back to this uh, very first slide about the study abroad miss. So through the stories of the students, we can see that uh, it's not naturally granted for the opportunities and access to the local communities about the total immersive experience. And sometimes the students use strategically use different uh, uh, options or different uh, strategies to um, engage with the target language practice is not necessarily talking to locals, right? We see the examples of talking to the international students community, etc. And also these transformative language learning experiences is uh, to provide more future possibilities uh, for uh, uh, the, the have the new emergent and transformative uh, identities um, during this study abroad uh, experiences. So uh, we observed from the uh, three cases and also the cases we discussed, uh, they also have a lot of identity struggles and difficulties uh, when they study abroad. However, there's a strong resistance in the field that to openly discussing such problems that the researcher really need to address um, in the future. And the study abroad context as a battlefield foregrounding the identity work and language learning, uh, as well as we need to place individuals in a multidimensional space. So we should not think identity as a fixed category, uh, but it's fluid and it's ever-changing as well. 
and the need more critical ex examinations of the intersectionality of identities. We do not have time to reflect on our discussion, but I do hope to, um, after this workshop, to think of for teachers, uh, maybe think of how we, we can engage students in ref critical reflection on identity, mobility, and also multilingualism in today's world. And also as students, which you are, a lot of you already reflected on your own experiences, right? So how to, you know, kind of uh, reflect critically uh, through this, uh, the, this process here. And we hope to use the last five minutes, do we have five minutes, to talk about some of the implications for students. Uh, we do not really have an answer yet, but we do hope to, for you to think of uh, the questions like, how do we recognize and reflect on our own identity negotiation and maximize your experiences overseas? And how to strategically use different social, cultural, and linguistic resources to engage in language learning and use uh, when you're in a, a different uh, context? And how do we cope with call, uh, challenges in such uh, transnational contexts? It's not limited to just the study of going study abroad outside of the US and also study abroad experience in the United States as well, right? So how to critically uh, and strategically reflect on that uh, to help uh, uh, take, take, help you uh, uh, with your uh, better, have a better experiences and future possibilities as well. And for educators, we hope to uh, raise awareness and critical reflections for students to reflect what they bring and what they developed in terms of the identities and rethink the study abroad context and the goals of designing such uh, curriculum and uh, curricular activities, what are we actually doing uh, for doing those activities? Do we just throw them into the wild and they would naturally talk to the locals, right? So what kind of activities should we design for the students to engage with the uh, target language practice? and how the students understand their relationship to the world and the future possibilities to construct this kind of life-changing experience, this kind of transformative experiences. What are we actually trying to provide for the students, right, through these uh, experiences? And also think about the pre and the post preparation for the study abroad students to uh, navigate uh, their experiences abroad. So uh, uh, I want to, Dr. Diao, do you have any other? Yeah, I would that? also like to, um, to take a moment to just acknowledge the time we are in. We are, we are living currently in a time with a lot of restrictions on study abroad, right? And so why are we talking about this? I, I think as the reflections have revealed um, that study abroad and all these challenges that students encounter are very much not limited to study abroad. It's about transnationality, right? It's about transnational, uh, in transnational processes, such as international adoptees, such as, you know, immigrants. We are navigating through different cultural contexts, we are facing, we're encountering all these ideologies that link who we are to what we speak, to what we should do, right? And study abroad is just one aspect of such transnational lives and the ideologies that we have to cope with. And sometimes we have to, you know, counteract. And so um, I very much appreciate all these, you know, very compelling stories that you have shared with us. Um, and I think together at this moment in history, um, I think we really need to be more, even more critical and more reflective of these ideologies and of our identities, how some of identities these are really, um, you know, connected to all these, you know, societal ideologies about who we are and what we should speak and how we should be critical of them. And on that note, I think we're pretty much done. Um, it's been a pleasure and um, I very much enjoyed this uh, workshop. I hope you did too. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much. Let's give a, uh, I, I don't know how we clap, you know, give a, <laughs> a round of applause to our uh, workshop facilitators. Thank you. Thank you so much.
you have certainly broadened our horizon, certainly in, in many ways. Um, this is a, uh, you know, it's not talked about enough. We, we, we often associate study abroad with a particular kind of region or space. And you have brought us to transcend you know, the geographical boundaries, but also those sort of intellectual boundaries as well, to think about what is study abroad about, right? And then what it entails in terms of language and social practice. And the language is a very tricky thing. It's a double-edged sword. Some people, if you speak the language not well enough, people say you are not Chinese enough. If you speak too well, and then you, how can you be American? You're not American enough, right? Here you go. I mean, so, and, and uh, in, I enjoyed our group discussion, which was made possible because of your, the design of your workshop. I mean, there was this huge issue of whether you yourself, or we ourselves have experienced, for example, the, the racial division, the racial divide in our prior experience. And that will have a lot to do with how we come to terms with or how we perceive you know, what other people are doing and saying about us and how we are being positioned. So it is all this sort of a cultural, very rich cultural hist historical kind of embeddedness in us. And this is the complex us, the self that we bring to bear on each and every encounter in these various kinds of spaces. So there's a lot of food for thought. So thank you again. Um, what a wonderful uh, finale for our end of the year for, for, the, for, for the Center for Multilingual Intercultural Communication. So for that, thank you also. We um, uh, will be in touch. Uh, we have your contact information and um, this uh, session has been recorded. So those of us who are not able to attend today will be able to benefit from your discussion and workshop afterwards. Thank you again very much.